the contributions that your family and your great-grandparents made to this city in the creation of a new way of life. And if we would learn to love each other, look out for each other, and care for each other, oh man. We are one of the top rated independent television series in the state of Alabama. Today, Schloss Furnaces is the only one of the 52 furnaces that operate in Birmingham that still exists. It's no longer operational as an iron foundry, but it is operational as a tourist attraction and as a venue where you can bring your family and understand this industry and its contributions that your family and your great-grandparents made to this city in the creation of a new way of life. Birmingham, Alabama is a post-Civil War city created after the Civil War uh, based on the iron and steel industry. During the war, they had found that all of the raw materials needed to make iron, iron ore, coal, and limestone, all occurred geographically in the same formations in this area. When the railroads were built after the Civil War, they came together in what is now downtown Birmingham, giving industrialists a cheap and efficient way to ship the raw materials in and the finished products out. And so Henry Fairchild de Bartleyman took the knowledge of the iron and steel industry and the raw materials, built the first furnace here in Birmingham, and within 10 years, James Withers Sloss founded Sloss Furnaces. So by 1882, 10 years after the founding of the city, Sloss Furnaces is built. And today, it's the only one of the 52 furnaces that operated in the Birmingham district that remains for the public to come and visit and to understand 
our history and the history of our great-grandparents. Uh, what Bessemer did uh, is he figured out that if you blew air through molten iron uh, for long enough and at high enough pressure, uh, what would happen is um, the excess carbon that is in the molten iron would attach to that air and it would then blow out of the top uh, of, the of the converter. Uh, and so what you're left with after a time is steel. You know, of course, southern industry uh, was nearly non-existent prior to the Civil War. Um, and it's uh, with the advent or the founding of Birmingham in the early 1870s uh, is really the first major um, industrial center uh, to be founded in the South. By 1950, Sloss Furnaces um, uh, was the largest single producer of merchant pig iron in the world. You know, it's one thing to read about 3,000 degree furnaces um, or, or 2,800 degree uh, molten iron. Uh, it's a wholly different idea, a wholly different thing to um, to actually experience that firsthand, to be standing, you know, four feet away from uh, a ladle full of, of molten iron. Uh, and it's something you just can't really experience uh, through reading. You can't experience it secondhand. The one most important element for industrialization, for the Industrial uh, Revolution to take place, uh, was iron uh, and the uh, ability to um, to release it uh, from ore uh, and uh, then able, basically the ability to cast it uh, into objects, into shapes, uh, and then even to refine it into things like steel. Um, if it weren't for iron, the Industrial Revolution would not have taken place. We would put in the centerfold one of our new uh, mixing ladles to ensure matchless uniformity. And it, again, just to reassure that all this new technology is going to provide you with even a better product. To kind of calm the fears of their customers uh, about the mechanization that they were undergoing, they just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that the pig iron that they were producing was actually going to be even better than before. Boss Furnaces is the only 20th century uh, museum that speaks to this country's industrial heritage and that's being preserved and it's a place where you can come and actually see what it was like to work at a blast furnace, what it, you know, to imagine what it must have looked like and sounded like and smelled like. But actually, when I think about it, that's rather sad that this is the only site because really what made this country great and made it a world power is the industrialism, is the Industrial Revolution. Well, I hope everybody learned a little bit more about Sloss Furnaces, not only the technical elements of Sloss, but the human elements, because there were a lot of different elements that made up Sloss Furnaces. And when you come out today, although it's very quiet, you can still get an idea of, of what it must have sounded like and what these men must have experienced working here on a daily basis. Louis Armstrong is, you know, we refer to him as the ambassador to jazz, you know, somebody who, you know, a lot of people give him his credit as to being the creator of jazz, when in reality, jazz was created in New Orleans by the people, the very people that came from all over the world and brought their music there. And what Louis Armstrong served as was the person that who brought it up the Mississippi to Chicago and then spread spread it throughout the world. Follow, following, you know, King Oliver, Joe Oliver. Joe Oliver was his mentor. But Joe Oliver stayed in Chicago and Louis Armstrong and others spread out and took the music to, to New York, which was like, you know, the, one of the hubs of, cultural hubs of the world. Louis Armstrong said that um, Joe Oliver could have been just as famous, but he didn't, he never left Chicago. And that people were getting famous or becoming famous in New York City playing Joe Oliver. But Louis Armstrong happened to come along with the right information, the right sound at the right time. And before, which is really little not known, is that Louis Armstrong, before he was known for his voice, he was a virtual, virtuoso trumpet player. He's a magical trumpet player. 
all my money had been going and what the boys in the band had been hitting at all along. That was the beginning of the end for Lil and Louis Armstrong. Someday you'll be sorry the way you treated me was wrong I was the one who gave you all all you know your friends had you to make me sing another song well started hanging out after that down at this club called Sunset. That's where I first met my manager Joe Glazer. He was managing it, fronting it for Al Capone. Now Al Capone was a cute little fat boy, always dressed up. Looked like a little college professor who had just come out of school to teach us something in New York. He said, oh yeah, you're going to New York, you're leaving early in the morning, and you're taking the first thing smoking. And he pulls out this pistol and aims it straight at me. Man with my eyes as big as saucers. I said, well, maybe I am going back to New York then. They didn't like the way one of the boys in the band held his cigarette in a fancy holder. See, they wasn't used to seeing black men dressed up the way we were. I spent Almost a year of my life when I was 12 years old in the war zone for boys was shooting off a pistol doing Mardi Gras. Trying to be tough, you know. Oh, wasn't nothing square about me. I'd like to dedicate this next song to the Memphis City Police. And we swung into... Oh, I'll be glad when you dead, you rascal, you. I'll be glad when you dead, you rascal, you. Oh, I let you into my home. You wouldn't leave my wife alone. Oh, I'll be glad when you dead, you rascal, you. <laughs> now, when we finished, the police came rushing up on the stage. The boys in the band turned to run. But they grabbed my hand, and they started to shake it. And they said, Mr. Armstrong, the people loved it. And we ain't never had nobody to dedicate a song to us before. <laughs> it seems that they're trying to integrate the schools in this little stream of junior high black kids trying to get in, and around them is this mob. And the mayor, the governor was old fetish, sent in the militia to help stop the kids from integrating the school. And I'm sitting there watching this. Watch those kids all scared. And did you see that? That grown man spit in that little girl's face. Well, ain't somebody gonna do something about it? My people, the black people, ain't asking nobody for nothing. All we want is a bad shape. And when I see a grown man spit in the little girl's face, I think I got a right to get sore. A man wants a place. In the sun, a man wants a gal. About to say, the Jill B. Gum is loving wife. He wants a chance to give his kids a better life. Well, hello, brother. Hello. Miss America, 2005 is Miss Alabama. Yeah.
school classrooms. And we aren't allocating the proper funding for cancer research. And this year, hopefully, I will be a spokesperson for one of the national pediatric cancer research groups. My platform launch will be next month. And I'm really looking forward to embarking on a national speaking tour, talking about this issue, educating people about it. Because again, like Miss America, people are misinformed. They don't realize how prevalent cancer is in children. That's something that I am also going to counter those misperceptions this year. And the license plate actually will be available, hopefully, by the end of November, the beginning of December. We've already raised, just in our one year pre purchase time period, we raised uh, about $85,000 for cancer research. And Our next performer, Paige Phillips Carnell, Miss Alabama.
all over the world. Young folks come up to me and they say, hey, Pops, what do you mean, what a wonderful world? What about all the wars all over the place? That ain't so wonderful. It seems to me that it ain't the world that's so bad, but what we doing to it. And if we would learn to love each other, look out for each other, and care for each other, oh man, then we'd see what a wonderful world this can really be. Love. Oh, love. That's the secret. I see green the green. Red roses too. Now, I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies blue and the flowers they so white. The bright, blessed days in the dark, sacred nights. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, the colors of the rainbow. Pretty in the sky. They're also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands. They be saying, Oh man, how do you do? <laughs> now, they're really saying, I love you. I am babies crying. And I, I watch them grow. And there was not much more an old satchel mold would ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. This television series was created 17 years ago to respect everyone, all artists and all of the organizations that support the arts and shows humanity in our society. In this copycat world, we have seen that you see one television series and then you see imitations on the other networks. This does not show respect for arts and humanity. We need to respect the creativity of everyone. Another unique aspect of this television series is we give the films that we shoot and create back to the organizations. What better way to show respect for their own creativity? No other program, no other network can do this because of legal restrictions. We own our own films. We are an independent television series, so we can do this legally. And we want to do this ethically because we want to show true respect for the arts and humanity. Imitation in reality is not a form of flattery. It's pirating the original concepts, the work and dedication of this television series. When there was no television series out there that showed respect for everyone, for all the organizations, for all creative visions that exist, you know one needed to exist.